All right guys, Murph's here. And today we're gonna to talk about this. A short magazine, Lee Enfield, number one Mark III star. Or is it? Now, before we get into what this very interesting firearm is, we do need to get into a little bit of background. So I'm gonna kind of tease you with this information here for a little bit. So let's talk. All right, 1857. The Indian Rebellion took place and lasted for roughly about a year and a half when the Indian people decided that they had had enough of the East India Trading Company, which was kind of like the British Crown's representative in the region. I'm going to tell you guys right off the bat, when it comes to this certain aspect of history, I'm not a historian, um, especially when it comes to the British. So don't expect like precision information right now. I'm just giving you guys a brief overview. If you want to know more about this, I'm sure there are some YouTube videos out there you can watch or you can pick up a book. So what I'm giving you is kind of the cliff notes aspect. Uh, don't expect anything too thorough. It is kind of interesting. I just haven't had a chance to do like full on research into it yet. So anyway, they're fighting. They initially start their beef with the East India Trading Company, which was representing British interests at the time. And then Great Britain sends down a bunch of soldiers and there's a very fierce conflict where both sides commit some pretty terrible atrocities. In 1858, it gets completed and quite a few things come about from that. First off, the East India Trading Company gets a lot of their influence in the area, very much so limited. And then second off, the Indians get an opportunity to have a little bit more control over their own affairs. Now, keep in mind that we're talking about Imperial Great Britain, so they have a lot of colonies and commonwealths and all that kind of stuff, and they're kind of trying to figure out how best to manage these things so that they don't have a whole bunch of Americas going on. Now, there was another consideration that came out because of that rebellion, and that was just how well armed does your police force in these commonwealths and colonies need to be. Now, it was already very common at this time that when it came to having a colony or a commonwealth, there was always a question of arming their military so that they could support the crown. Now, there were kind of two options when it came to this. They could either A, buy arms from the British, which a lot of times were going to wind up being kind of second tier weapon systems, maybe stuff that they were starting to cycle out, that they could go ahead and sell and recoup some cost back on. Also be able to send parts packages and all that kind of stuff instead of like scrapping them. So they would send those to the commonwealths. Or the commonwealths could establish their own arms manufacturer and then produce what would, more, what would be the standard arm for the British army at that time and be able to use the same weapon system, have the same ammunition, all that kind of stuff. And that would be preferred, but not everyone had the money to do so. But then the question becomes, what do you arm the police forces with or how armed are the police forces? Now, it's already at least pretty well known that the British don't necessarily just arm every bobby that's out there walking around, right? You need very specific circumstances for British police to go armed. One of those is riot disruption and all that kind of stuff. And that was the main thing that the British were looking at at that time to make sure that they didn't have another rebellion like they did in India. However, how well armed do you need people quelling a, a riot to be? Like in all theory, it ought to be pretty easy, pretty quick to dispel a riot. Also, in addition to that, you have to take into account what if those arms get stolen? Now you've potentially armed the rebellion with weapons that are just as capable as what the British military is using and that is not a good outcome. Or what if people have deserted with their weapons. So now not only did they bring a capable weapon system, but they also brought training along with it in order to be able to teach people how to use that weapon. That's not a good outcome. That's of some great concern when it comes to quelling the rebellion later on. So that is when the British came up with a new process of taking much older arms and turning and converting them over into shotguns for issue to police. And the, the first and most outstanding example I can think of for this would be the Martini Henry rifles that were bored out and switched over to a proprietary shotgun cartridge. And this was very advantageous to the British because this gave, it allowed them to take an older weapon system and sell it off. So they were making back some money on that. The gun got bored out 
over to a shotgun, which a shotgun in open warfare is inferior to a rifle, especially at that time. And then it ran on a proprietary cartridge. So this way, rebels just capturing the shotguns would not be helpful. They would also have to capture the ammunition because it would be extremely difficult for them to just manufacture it on their own and the ammunition's only getting supplied by the government. So ipso facto, it's gonna be really hard to run a rebellion based off of captured arms. But it didn't stop with the Martini Henry. It actually went so far as to include the number one Mark III, which is what I'm holding here. So this is a number one Mark III star musket. And at this point, we can start talking about this weapon system specifically. Now, let's go ahead and we'll start from one end to the other and we'll talk about this, this musket, as it's called. So here we have the standard Try to find a good way to show you guys this. We have the standard front sight with the protective ears of the number one Mark III star. From there, we run down to the normal nose cap that you find on these when they were rifles, as well as the bayonet lug. I cannot imagine that anybody was affixing a bayonet to this. It just doesn't really seem to be helpful uh, by any means. Moving back to here, we have a 25.2 inch barrel, which is completely covered in wooden stock which is a pretty nice look. This wood is in extremely good condition. Uh, I'm actually very pleased with this musket. Now back here we have a tangent rear sight which has been pinned in place because as it turns out when it comes to muskets you really don't have that much range and you're not gonna try to reach 2000 meters with it. So there was no need to have an adjustable capability. Coming back to here, we have the famous Lee Enfield bolt, which unfortunately, even though it's renowned for its smoothness, it's kind of wasted in this case, because as you can see, we do not have a magazine. Instead, we have a block of wood and a bit of steel placed across here because this is a single shot shotgun. Well, single shot musket by the British classification, shotgun by ATF classification. We'll get into that here in a moment. The bolt, is still glass smooth. It is absolutely amazing. However, it's only really effectively smooth when you have a 10 shot magazine combined with it. But I like it. I like it a lot. In addition to that, your bolt handle drops you off right by the trigger, which again, if you were trying to do a mad minute with a 10 shot magazine, this bolt would absolutely be up to it. This is in great condition, but it being a single shot, Musket, it doesn't really matter to us. Now you'll note that I keep referring to this as a musket. This followed the same pattern as the Martini Henry. This barrel has been bored out from a 303 to a 410. And this fires a proprietary 410 Mark I cartridge. So by ATF standards, this is a shotgun. By British nomenclature, this is a musket. And we'll, we'll kind of get into that when we talk about the ammunition here in just a little bit. Now, we do have the two-piece stock design, and this is actually of extremely good quality. I feel no wobble at all, which is kind of surprising for these guns. And if you look here, you might be able to make out our British crown marking, and that it is a number one Mark III star produced originally in 1943. Now, keep in mind the British dropped the number one Mark III after World War I and it switched over to the number four. That was their preferred. However, a lot of the commonwealths like Australia continued to produce this rifle. Australia con continued to use the number one Mark III all the way into Korea. And actually, the India, uh, India itself rebarreled these in the 1960s to 308 to continue using them. So the the number one Mark III has had a wide variety of uses from many different countries and many different calibers. Now on this side, directly below our safety, which is in a fantastic location for use with the right-handed thumb, you might be able to see the markings Rifle Factory India and 1949, which is when this gun would have been converted over to the musket pattern. Now, I don't know when 
These guns sort of getting converted over to the musket pattern. The oldest combination I've seen yet is a 1917 number one Mark III star that had been rebarreled in the early 1940s. So based on that, I'm kind of guessing that perhaps maybe the British started selling some stuff off in the 1930s and those got reman remanufactured. That's, that's a guess. Um, perhaps they were taking old stock of emergency rifles that were in terrible condition from the war and sending them to India so that uh, RFI could switch them over to the musket pattern. I'm not sure. They're, these are kind of difficult to find information on. It turns out that not that many people care. And we'll get into that more here in a little bit. Now, our trigger is a single staged trigger, which I'm really not going to spend too much time talking about it because as it turns out, this is a single shot musket and I mean, it doesn't matter. You're really not going to talk about the groups that you get out of this thing. Now here we have a semi pistol grip stock. I love semi pistol grips. This is probably the most relaxed and closest to a straight stock as you'll see. However, with this nice hook here at the bottom, it's very easy to pull this shotgun into your shoulder, which I know I'm using shotgun and musket interchangeably, but if you think about it, they kind of are. So just sort of, I guess, live with it. But I, I love this stock. I love this hook right here. If I had to have something that was more akin to a straight stock, but called itself a pistol grip, this would be it. And then coming back to here, we have our butt stock, which is in pretty good condition, minus some pretty good chunks taken out of it. But what I really love about this stock and what actually made me select this particular shotgun were the markings in the stock. So this has some more RFI markings back here. There's an old imprint left from the disc that would have had the unit marking. And on this side, we have a rack number. Now, what is a rack number? Well, anytime an armorer puts these things in a weapons rack and all that kind of stuff, and it has to keep track of all the maintenance and everything like that, it's a lot harder to run these down by their serial number. It's a lot easier to associate that serial number with a rack number, put those numbers in order in the arsenal rack, and then anytime they're like, oh, well, shotgun number three needs to be, I don't know, cleaned or whatever, they can go to it, you know, they can figure out who rifle number three belongs to, and then they can run to the rack, pull it out, and hand it to that guy and be like, yo, go clean your, go clean your shotgun. So... That's, that's why I find this one so interesting. There are so many markings and there's just, it's in really good shape. This is in incredible shape. I wish it was still chambered in 303 and in this condition. I, I, would, I would be beside myself with amazement. Now, you'll also see that we have the brass butt plate here, which is pretty uh, typical on these rifles. And then we also have a spot here for a cleaning kit. I always check these to see if maybe somebody's left a note, you know, or, or like a, maybe a letter or something like that. But it turns out I've, uh, <laughs> I have fingered a lot of these cleaning kit holes and have found no notes. So that's unfortunate. We still have our sling swivels, uh, but <clears throat> I haven't picked up a sling yet. And actually I still have the original tags on this shotgun from when I got it. Now, where did I get this gun? Because this is, this is very weird, this is very interesting, right? Well, as I mentioned in a previous video, I helped a gun shop that had, had a falling out with a partner move their entire inventory. Uh, a couple of U-Haul trips and I helped them just pick up all kinds of stuff. And that was the problem was that they were very eclectic people. They had just a lot of it, a lot of it was garbage. Some of it was actually worth something, but a lot of it was very much so garbage. But we moved all of it. And I was, I was pretty young at the time, but when we were done, this was my payment. And I, was, I selected this from among several of them because it was in the best condition. It had the most markings on it. And that's what made me get this gun. Now, the other two were in pretty good condition, in all honesty. However, this one definitely looked the sharpest and still had cosmoline on it, which I've now done my best to clean out. I think I probably need to go another round cleaning it out some, but 
and this wood is most definitely impregnated with it, but I'm, I'm really not that big of a, in that big of a hurry to clear the wood out of this. Now, I did say that we would talk about the ammunition. However, I don't have any open. So I'm actually gonna roll in a picture of what a single cartridge looks like right now. That's extremely interesting. So this is the 410 Mark I cartridge, and it is in a 303 casing with a 98 grain 41 caliber projectile double crimped into the nose. That's what the slug looks like. Now there was also a blank, which no one really cares about because it's a blank, and then a buckshot round. All of which are based around a straight walled 303 casing. It never gets necked, it's just straight walled the entire time. Now, I do have a single crate, unopened, 180 round crate of 410 Mark I ammunition. As you can see here, uh, this is actually the original wax seal, which I accidentally hooked with the thumb when I pulled this thing out of the box that it came in and managed to pull free. But I have not opened this at all. And I probably won't, honestly, guys. I haven't shot this gun yet, and I'm probably not gonna shoot it anytime soon because this just speaks to the collector in me. I can't help but just be amazed from the collector's standpoint just how interesting this box is. This wooden crate with its, its looped rope handle and you know wax seal and all that kind of stuff like this is just cool now if i were to find a second crate of this ammunition i would absolutely take this thing to the range and i would shoot up that whole crate and it would be so much fun but this i just can't bring myself to open this yet at least yet now i've also seen quite a few videos where this ammunition has a lot of primer issues and stuff like that because it's extremely old uh, a lot of the stuff hasn't been produced since like the 60s, or at least was produced in the 60s. So now we're talking about 60-year-old ammunition. A lot of it's not in very good shape. A lot of it was not stored very well. This is very dusty, very dirty. I don't think it was stored all that well either. All right. So if I'm not going to shoot it, and I can't find ammunition for it, what do I use this for? Well, guys... This thing's a wall hanger. You know, in the very absolute worst case, not even realistic scenario, this is a shotgun I would provide to somebody in like a zombie apocalypse or something crazy like that. You know what I mean? I would go ahead and crack that case open and if there was someone who maybe I didn't trust that much and I'd be like, hey man, you want to work with me? Well, this is what you get and give them a single shot shotgun with some outdated ammunition or perhaps throw this out there and trade or something like that. I have no practical purpose for this gun. Now you might say, oh good, well you're using it as an investment opportunity. That's why you're not shooting it, right? But the problem is, I don't think these are gonna be very valuable. I don't think very many people know about them. The only people who would really have an interest in them, especially in a gun that you really can't get ammunition for, would be Enfield collectors who would suddenly find out that there was a single type of Enfield that they didn't have. And there ain't that many of those of those guys out there. So I'm not exactly holding out for that as being a possibility. Now, Classic Arms did just bring in uh, a huge load of these shotguns. However, the examples that I've seen are terrible. Every inch of the metal is covered in rust. It is eaten away. Um, there's deep, deep pitting. The wood is not in good shape. It looks like they've been left out in the open. Like somebody just dropped them down a well or something like that for a couple of years and then pulled them back up. They're in pretty bad condition and they're going for about $75. So you kind of get what you pay for. However, with that being the case and this being in such good condition, I think I would still be lucky to get like 200 for them because it doesn't change the fact that you can't get ammunition, and it doesn't change the fact that it's a police arm, not a military arm, so that kind of disrupts the interest in it, honestly. Some people really like that that the surplus, regardless of whether or not it's police or military. However, I have found that military arms are far more collectible than rebarreled police arms. Overall, that's that's been my experience. So what do I recommend you use this gun for? Well guys, I can't say that I would give any recommendation other than what I've already given you. As far as keeping it as a wall hanger, maybe it'll be valuable someday, but I doubt it. Now something that you can do with these and has been done is you can 
remount the chamber and get this chambered for a normal 410 cartridge already on the market. I can't bring myself to do it once again from the collector standpoint in me. This thing just really speaks to my collector side and won't allow me to do anything to it. I just I just can't. I've got plenty of practical arms. This is this is one of my few impractical arms and it's just going to remain that way. I can't bring myself to cut this chamber and actually be able to shoot this gun. But if you can, more power to you. Now, something that I would throw out there is that if you do that or even if you try even if you find enough of this ammunition to actually be able to get out there and use it for something I don't think it'll be the most effective hunting arm the most I can see hunting with it would be if you had this reamed out to take a normal 410 shot shell and going after squirrels with it for fun literally just for funsies I wouldn't really recommend it as a deer hunting rifle, uh, deer hunting shotgun excuse me um, it's a little weighty for uh, perhaps a younger person, it's also a little long for perhaps a younger person to use it as a deer gun. I guess you could maybe say that it would really add a lot of uh, difficulty for someone like myself to use it in deer hunting. However, I don't necessarily, you'd, you'd have to work a deer in really close for in order for me to consider this to be an ethical way to hunt it. It's a smooth bore barrel and a round ball shotgun slug well, shotgun slug so it, it it really is effectively a musket and i think it's going to have musket like accuracy and i just i don't think that's worth it not when you have plenty of practical options out there that could do it better a self defense arm absolutely not it's a single shot 410 of proprietary make of ammunition it's just it's not worth it you're you're not going to get any advantage out of this you could do it i just wouldn't recommend it like i guess use this to shoot somebody to get their gun is, is the best that I can come up with. Now, that's not to trash talk this gun. Like I said, it's in beautiful condition, and I absolutely love using it as a talking piece whenever people come into the gun room and they're looking over my collection. This is one of the guns that I pull down to talk about because it is so interesting. So, as a talking point, it's killing it. Just as a practical arm, it's not even on the same plane of existence. All right, guys. That's pretty much what I have for this. So, have a good day.